Perfect. Hello, guys. Good morning. Um, I am very pleased to let you know that I am here with uh, Richard Wontora. He is uh, part of the Frank Leo's team, who, which is the best uh, team in Canada. And uh, I can't wait for him to show you all the numbers that he prepared for this live for us to see how interesting the market is um, reacting to all this, you know, <laughs> craziness. So, um, hi, Richard. Thank you hi, so much. A happy Canada Day weekend, Carla. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, please uh, tell us a little bit um, what's going on. I'm going to put uh, some of the um, here presentation that he has prepared with some graphs. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure how easy that people can read it, but basically what this chart is showing us is the active inventory. So that's for uh, freehold products uh, and condo apartments and condo townhouses in the GTA today. So there's a, a number of different lines that you see. There's different years. So the purple represents uh, 2022, the green is last year, uh, and then uh, it, the red is in 2020, and then the blue is being uh, the year before, which is 2019. So this is just showing you the amount of inventory that we typically have. Now, you normally have sort of a seasonality to sales. Um, so active inventory normally picks up in the spring. It drops off a little bit in the summer and then picks up in August and September, and then dies off towards the end of the year. So now if you take a look, um, if we're, the, the important indicators really, if you take a look at it, is if we're comparing against last year, so the green line shows you that inventory is significantly or was significantly lower than it had been for years gone by. So if we're talking about July numbers, you see, uh, Carla's hovering over the numbers, but visually you can see that it's significantly lower. Last year's numbers were significantly lower, you know, for the in, basically the entire year. Now, if we compare that to 2022, so the purple line, uh, we started the year really, really low in terms of inventory, and then now it's building and building and building. So you see that we're significantly higher than we were um, last year and you know even if we go back so you have to kind of go back to to 2019 in terms of having higher inventory numbers so this is just showing you the amount of homes that are currently listed for sale so there's a little bit of a saving grace from from the sales perspective is that inventory remains low so we haven't really seen that there's been a significant increase in the number of people that are forced to sell or that feel that they need to sell for financial reasons at this point, despite where inflation is going. Um, you know, high inflation numbers typically mean that people have less disposable income. So what we're kind of seeing is that people are changing the way they spend their money a little bit. So rather than going out to perhaps dinner or buying a steak, they're buying hamburger, right? So they're buying a little bit more value conscious and you probably see bigger lineups at places like Walmart as opposed to, you know, the fine delicatessens, right? So, you know, people have bills to pay. Their gas prices are quite high. Your heating costs are going to be high. So from all that perspective, people still need to pay their mortgages. So they're just putting their money into their mortgage as opposed to putting their money into, you know, food and things along those lines. So they're just buying uh, perhaps lower quality, less expensive uh, things, and maybe buying a little bit more value, you know, from that perspective. So you do see that, um, you know, inventory now is, is, you know, not too bad. And then if we move over to the next chart, uh, the next chart is really showing us the sales. So the same categories again. Uh, so this is freehold properties as well as condominium properties and the amount of homes that are sold. So again, you normally see that sort of spring market where you have a ramp up in February and March, and then it falls off towards the summer, picks up again back in the fall. So what we're seeing is 
Uh, if you look at the inventory numbers for now, and this is a forecast because the official numbers are not out yet, but we take a look and see that the sales numbers are significantly lower than they have been for the last three years. Now, if you actually look at it and you go into a little bit more detail, uh, these are the lowest sales numbers since 1996. Uh, so this is really low in terms of sales. So, you know, there's a lot of people and we talk about uh, perhaps the fear of. So we've seen a little bit of a, a price growth and the people were what they call FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. So they were afraid that they're going to lose on a sale of a property. So they would be more aggressive. Now we're seeing a little bit of a change in buyer mentality. They're more of a fear of overpaying. So rather than, you know, thinking that if they don't buy this one, that that house is going to be fifty, a hundred thousand dollars more expensive tomorrow, they're thinking that maybe it'll be less expensive tomorrow at then today. And then the other part of that too is that, you know, now that we've opened up a little bit from our, you know, get a freedom standpoint. People are allowed to travel again. People are vacationing. They're going out now. So you see a little bit of that sort of pent up travel behavior. People are leaving and going away on vacation. They're going to people's cottages. They're spending more time relaxing. So the buyer has sort of, you know, left the market to a certain extent. So you have a combination of factors, right? And that's what's kind of driving the the pricing or sorry the the sales numbers down wow. so yeah it's i mean to me a lot of these things are all inter you know connected so um now if you look at the next chart so the next chart is something that we call months of inventory so months of inventory is kind of the absorption rate of homes so if we have in a particular neighborhood uh, say a hundred houses for sale, and in that neighborhood, normally you have a hundred houses that sell in a month. That's one month's worth of inventory. If you have two hundred homes for sale in a neighborhood, and they normally sell one hundred a month, that's two months worth of inventory. So the way that we kind of look at it is anything below four months of inventory is a seller's market. Between four and six months worth of inventory is a balanced market. And then if it goes over six months of inventory, it's a buyer's market. So from that perspective, if you take a look and think about, again, you know, the demand. And if you look at the chart for 2021, we really just skimmed one month's worth of inventory and that was it. And then even towards the end of the year, you're looking at almost three quarters of a month worth of inventory. In certain areas, it was half a month's worth of inventory. So, you know, that's you're seeing a lot of absorption in that case. And that's what really has driven price growth. Now, if we look at the purple line, so we sort of peaked price wise in February. And then now you see in March inventory not being absorbed to the same rent. So months of inventory started the year in January, February, and March, again, below one. And now it's shot up to be about three and a half months worth of inventory. So we're moving in the wrong direction, um, you know, if you're a seller, because there's more competition out there. There's more inventory for people to select from. And buyers are not in that same rush and fear to overpay. So sometimes when you would get into a situation where there's lots of competition. So if you have, you know, nobody else bidding on your property, you're most likely going to bid at a market value or, you know, near the asking price or you want a little bit of a deal on it. Um, but if you have 10 or 20 or 50 people competing, that drives the price up because, you know, you, you're, you're in competition from that standpoint. Uh, and we still see some properties in that, in that vein that are experiencing multiple offers. It's usually ones that are a little bit more price uh, price lower, so it's sort of more of an entry level price point. And part of that is you do have the entry level buyer, so that that person is still out there looking to move out of their rental unit because rents have been increasing and they're putting a lot more money into rents. Um, and then the other side of it is that 
maybe you used to qualify for a million dollar mortgage, but because of interest rates now and maybe you know loss of income or cut back on hours, you're only qualifying for an eight hundred or a six hundred thousand dollar mortgage. So that means that you're going to be looking at a price ceiling that has been a little bit lower. So you're competing with more people in that entry level price point. So you do see a lot of competition on the value oriented properties, um, and then things that are typically in the one and a half, two million dollars, three million dollars. You know, maybe one day if I win the lottery, you know, those types of properties for me. Uh, you're seeing less competition in that space. And those are the properties that, unless it's an ideal location and, you know, kind of stunning home moving ready and someone's been looking for it, you're not seeing that level of competition in that space, right? And, you know, you see a, a lot of salespeople kind of playing games with pricing. Um, you know, my clients, I, I showed them a property in Pickering last week that was originally listed for, and get this, in, in June of this year, it was listed for $2.8 million. No sales, no interest. They dropped the price to 2.5, no sales, no interest. They dropped the price to one, sorry, 2.1, no interest. Then they dropped it to 1.5 with an offer date, right? So they had a lot more interest. They had two offers and then they got nothing near where they wanted to be. So now wow. that property is back up to 2.1, which is, I guess, kind of where they think the value is uh unfortunately my guys were in the 1.7 to 1.8 range and that's the number that they were thinking considering the location and, and competition and where they feel the market is going so of course of course mm -hmm. yeah no definitely there is a, a lot more for buyers um in terms of uh negotiation right like um even though it's a seller's market i i feel that um, the buyer has a little bit more, you know, uh, <laughs> more to say in the in the price. For I mean, sure. I mean, um, uh, a house is always gonna be value at whoever wants to pay whatever price, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the end of the day, I think, um, like you said, because of the lack of in inventory in 2020, 2021, um, obviously, you know, there was a lot of competition, but right. now when uh, there is less competition, then buyers have a little bit more, um, more power, more For power. Sure. <laughs> well, and the other thing that I think that you're seeing too is, you know, the investors that are out there, um, you know, they're looking for deals. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, housing still returns a good investment for people. Um, you know, from that standpoint, so investors are still looking for properties and ideally they would like them to be rental. So, you know, if they found a house that has a upper and a lower, you know, income property, those are the types of ones that they're looking for, but they feel that they want a deal, right? So they're not in a situation where they're competing, but they're going to come in typically, you know, more firm as opposed to things like home inspection and financing, but they're probably going to come in at a lower price, especially if there is no other people that are competing for that same type of house. And then that's what's going to drive prices down. If we start to see a, a change in sort of seller attitude in that, uh, you know, maybe that person, like, and, and the analogy that you kind of use is, you know, you could have your house listed for a million dollars. But if your neighbor has to sell their house because they lost their job, um, you know, there's a death in the family, they can't support it. And if that house now turns around and sells for 900000 right, that sets a new benchmark for your neighborhood. And unfortunately, your house may not be worth the same as he thought it was. So those other sales are really kind of, you know, if those people are forced into those decisions to make that move to sell at a reduced price point, the same way that we use, you know, competitive sales to gauge price growth, we also can look at it as prices coming down, right? So it's important to try to understand. And, you know, you can get into situations when you are listing a house that, you know, a seller will get into a house and, and you know, they think that their house is worth a certain value. And, you know, they said that Bob's house across the street sold for 1.5 in February, you know, I have a nicer house than Bob, so my house is worth more than 1.5. 
and then not even taking into consideration the changes in the market. And then what we're seeing is, you know, if you go into them and you tell that seller what's happening in the market and where you need to be priced, we're seeing that those sellers are turning around and thinking, oh, my house is still worth 1.5, 1.6. And then they list with an agent that gives them those numbers. And bear in mind, we have over 70,000 real estate agents that are licensed in the GTA. Uh, more than half of them sell one house or less a year. So they really don't know what the heck they're doing, right? So they're just really pricing a property to get a listing so that they have something. It, their intention is not necessarily to sell it. Yeah. And sometimes it's not really to have the best interest of, of the seller, right? For sure. Um, definitely is much better to go with uh, somebody that uh, does transactions. Why? Because um, first, they understand the market. Mm -hmm. They know um, exactly what's going on in the market. And, you know, um, definitely uh, those people that um, do um, this type of job only for like part time or something like that. It definitely mm. is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a challenge for 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 the industry and for the mm -hmm. client itself. Yeah, and it's not necessarily in anyone's best interest, right? I mean, you know, the seller is now going to be complaining that there's no showings, there's no offers, they need to sell, and then you know the agent is just going to basically try to drive a price reduction. And if prices are falling, you don't want to be in a position to follow the market down. You want to be, the, you know, if you need to sell, you want to be the next house to sell. You don't want to be following the market down because, you know, potentially if you wait a few months and if the market does fall a little bit more, you're going to be in a position where you're going to have to accept less if you need to sell. Yeah. So that leads us to the next slide. All right. All right. <laughs> So uh, this is, um, if we, we go back, so this goes back years and years and years, and this is just showing us the average pricing. Uh, so it goes back to January of 2010. So this is the average pricing uh, across the GTA. The blue represents uh, detached houses and the red uh, represents condo apartments. So you can see, you know, over the years, we've had some hiccups. Um, so we've seen some, you know, substantial price increases and then drops, um, and that kind of leads us to where we are this year, right? So prices, if, if Carly, if you go to the very top one, the peak of that market, so you can see the peak of the market across the GTA was in February of this year. So we were almost at $1.8 million of an average detached house in the GTA. Now, yeah, so that's kind of where we were. Now, if you go down to the right dot, just down a little bit more, keep one down, down, down. Okay, so July, you see that we're at 1.45, right? So we've dropped on average $350,000 from 1.8 to 1.45. So there's been a substantial price reduction. And, you know, remember what we were talking about before, the lack of inventory, uh, and, you know, that's what's driven this rapid price increase, right? Now that we're getting into a situation where the inventory has, uh, you know, balanced out a little bit more, they don't have that same rush, the, the same demand, people are in the situation where they need to sell. Maybe they bought another house, maybe they're moving, you know, out of the city, you know, you know, they bought a pre-construction condo that they need to move into. Uh, so for whatever situation, they need to sell. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, we are starting to see uh, a correction. So if Carla, you go to detached again, the July 2022 numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah, And then if you go to the left, just go straight left. Yeah. So we kind of see that, you know, we were at 1.45. August 21 was at 1.425 almost. So that's kind of where we've driven back to in terms of pricing. So basically, we've lost, you know, for most parts of the city, uh, the, the price growth that we've seen in the last year. Okay. So, you know, it really kind of depends. Um, it's difficult to say what the future holds. Um, you know, obviously, we're probably going to be looking at some additional price, uh, sorry, interest rate increases for the balance of the year. Um, you know, you can probably talk a little bit better than I can 
But my understanding is that we'll probably see another half to a point increase for the end of the, until the end of the year. And that really kind of depends again on inflation numbers, the consumer price interest index. So the Bank of Canada is trying to increase interest rates to bring inflation back under control because it's gotten a little bit out of hand. Um, so, and I'm not sure that interest rates are going to be able to impact that because a lot of the things are not necessarily interest related. So gas prices, you know, the war in the Ukraine, you know, those types of things are not going to be solved by increasing, you know, interest rates. The only thing it does is perhaps make people, you know, not go away on vacation, not drive so that they can save money that way. And then obviously as fuel prices increase, uh, the cost to transport, you know, food and, and whatnot to your local grocery store are going to increase, you know, at the same, the same rate. So, you know, from that standpoint, it's expected that, you know, uh, interest rates going up. So that means people have, again, less disposable income. If we have a little bit more in the way of slowing of the economy and, you know, there is a talk of a recession, although in the U.S. they changed the definition of recession. Um you know, so from that standpoint, if we get into a situation where there is a little bit of an economic downturn, people lose their jobs, we're going to see, you know, more people more needing to sell and more inventory coming to market. And if that inventory is not being absorbed, then, you know, it represents a, a challenge for prices. So, and then that kind of leads us to the next slide, which was really talking about, um, uh average rents so these are average leases in the the toronto area so um this is not my my chart uh, but needless to say uh he has tracked the inf like so basically studios are the green uh one bedrooms in yellow uh one plus den are in the gold uh two bedrooms are in the pink and then the two plus uh, uh den is in the red so you see trends for the last you know year have all been upwards there is a significant increase in the amount that you know if you're paying rent today what you're paying you know for that property so we do have a lot of you know immigration that is coming to canada and in specifically into the gta and then that's you know we're not having a lot more inventory available so there's not a huge amount of you know uh, properties that are for lease that are coming onto market. So there is a shortage of leases. We do see multiple offers, um, you know, on leases. Uh, That's so very interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting because, um, you know, a lot of um, people that are renting, they, I feel like they say, you know what, let's see where it takes us. Uh, yeah. We rent for an additional year, but um, it sounds like there is a lot of competition for leases as well for sure and then the other part and my daughter's in the same situation you know we rented a, a property for her a year and a half ago and then the average uh, rent in her building has gone up about 200 dollars per month right so it was a 1600 now it's 1800 dollars a month in her building um, and so if she were to leave and to go to another unit even the same building she's going to spend 200 dollars more or more uh, in order to secure that property so you find that people are going to stay where they are to try to take advantage of the rent controls that are, were in place. So they're not going to be likely to move because that means that they're going to be paying thousands of dollars more per year. And, you know, in a lot of people's case, they're not making that much more money than they had in the past. So it is a challenge as the rents go up. So, you know, people are not moving from that studio to the one bedroom, from the one bedroom to the two, which you would normally have sort of progression. Uh, so the amount of inventory available to lease is quite small. So as you add more people that are looking to rent, it adds more competition. So as you have new immigrants coming to the country, there's more in competition. Um, if those individuals that have been forced to sell their house need to sell their house, then they're in a position where they're now competing for leases as well. But they might be a little bit more capital rich. So, you know, the old expression, house rich, uh, cash poor. So if they sell their house, they could have lots of money in the bank, in which case, you know, for them to compete on a lease for an extra $100, $200 a month is not going to kill them. 
Um, you know, so from that standpoint, it is again something that is driving more and more competition, and it is something again that is driving prices upwards for leases. Wow. Yeah, yeah so, definitely is our our numbers that um, we want to see uh, because if people are on the edge of, uh, you know, having a a, a mortgage versus uh, the rent, like the rent definitely. The average rents have gone up significantly, and um, and I think it is one of those things that is not going to stop. Um, no, well, you don't have more inventory, right? Like, so there is more pre-construction units that are going to come to market, but you know the amount of inventory that is being built uh, is not keeping pace with demand. Yes. Yes. And, um, you know, there is a ton of immigration coming uh, this year. There is a ton of immigration that was accepted um, during the pandemic. A hundred percent, you know, I think like a lot of people have this misconception that immigration has stopped. And, and I think it was the opposite. Like uh, um, Canada opened um, their doors to... It starts to to immigration for people that were already here, and um, and we welcome a lot of immigration. And I think um, we, Canada will still welcome a lot more immigration. And uh, these um, prices will definitely increase, whether for rent or or for sale don't you think oh 100 and you know we have hundreds of thousands of people that are accepted you know to immigrate into canada um and then the other thing that you think about is where are they going to locate so those people are going to typically you know the bulk of them will come to the gta and the reason obviously is they're looking for employment and you know from that perspective they think that this represents the best opportunities for them to be employed you know, educationally, their children can go to some of the best universities in the world. So they're going to be coming to, you know, the GTA. And from that standpoint, it's going to increase demand on the rental side of things because house prices are, you know, pretty much unaffordable for most people. Uh, for first time buyers, it's very difficult. Yes. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Richard. This was um beyond what what i was <laughs> expecting thank you so much you you explain it in a very simple way where <laughs> in a you know you know when when somebody sees a chart like we're just like what's going on but sure. the explanation was incredible thank you so much and thank you so much for sharing these um this one as well which is uh for leases which is uh, very important for people who are looking to buy um right now um you know as you said like prices might drop again but at the same time yes the 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 interest rates uh will increase again and probably um you know we will see a little bit more increases uh, uh for the year probably in 2023 um we're gonna see a different market but nobody knows Nobody sure. knows. It's it's uh, it's very hard to predict, mm-hmm. and um, but what we do know is that um, demand drives uh, the inventory of real estate, and sure. the demand oh. is always going to be there. A hundred percent. And then the other thing you have to think about too, you know, as the lease rates go up, uh, people can now put more money in, rather than spending, you know, twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars on the lease. Maybe they have more money now because of the value of the lease to put towards a mortgage. And, you know, as prices have adjusted from from that perspective, it might represent a good opportunity for someone to move from a lease into an entry level house or to buy their condo as prices come back down to earth a little bit. Um, You know, because, again, we don't know where the prices go. If the government changes interest rate policy, you could get back into the same situation again where we're going to see escalation of prices. And you don't want to see, um, you know, all that inventory disappear. So right now you can go in typically. You have the opportunity to buy a house 
with conditions. You can go in there with a financing condition. You can go in there with a home inspection condition. And if you think about it, this is the first time in the last several years that we've been in that position. So it may behoove you to make that switch today rather than waiting for the market to run away again. Yes, uh, the way I look at it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a good opportunity for for people who want to, you know, um, enter into the market for a condo and, um, you know, put their feet on the door for the real estate investment. Because at the end of the day, you have to pay somewhere. You have to mm -hmm. either pay to your mortgage or you have to pay to, um, to the landlord. And... Yes, uh, I actually did an exercise with one of my clients. And for the first few years, you might be paying more towards your mortgage instead of the lease. Mm -hmm. But the, the, over time um, is when you really see the, um, the increase on your, on your investment. And, right. and uh, you know, it's still uh, <laughs> with these crazy prices and with these mm -hmm. crazy um things happening it still is a is a good investment for sure oh i you know i think long-term real estate or any sort of significant asset like that uh will have a good return on their investment right i mean the way that you you can't really look at things you know short term you know and try to buy at the you know the the trough of the market you kind of you know most people when they buy a stock right they average their stock over time right so you know don't take a look at your purchase and take a snapshot of it and compare it every month where it's, you know, it is, but think about it out for the long term, you know, and it's not something maybe year over year, but five years, 10 years from now, where do you think it will be? Exactly. And then that you kind of make your decision and base it based on that. Exactly. If you can make the move today and you're able to do that financially, then I always think that you should do that because, you know, either you're going to pay someone else's mortgage or you're going to pay your own. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's what leases are for, to mm -hmm. pay somebody else's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> mortgage. So yeah, yeah and, and uh, another thing that I uh, mentioned to one of my clients who is not prepared right now to buy is that it's a very good time for them to prepare themselves because at least it's not, we don't have the pressure that is going to increase very, very rapidly every month over month um, right. it's going to be the opposite it might uh, like you mentioned at some point that it might be a little bit flat for a little while mm -hmm. so it's a good opportunity for people who are um, in um, in that situation where they are preparing themselves and it's good we have we have no time something that we didn't have mm -hmm. for sure <laughs> for a long time absolutely all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, once again, I really, really appreciate um, you taking your time to prepare for this and for you to share with us all these uh, numbers. Thank you very, very much, Richard. You're welcome. Have a wonderful holiday and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.